Thank you everyone for joining us tonight. We're gonna wait a few minutes till everyone gets in and then we'll be ready to start. All right, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. Good afternoon, evening, wherever you're joining us. Um, we still have a few people logging in, so we're going to give them about another 30 seconds to join us and then we'll get underway. Okay, I think we're ready to get started. So thank you again for joining us for the Women in Medicine Intentional Leadership in Times of Change. This conference is presented by the Women in Medicine Summit in collaboration with Meeting Achievements. We are thrilled to be able to bring this conference to you virtually in this time of COVID-19. And we are delighted to have joining us today, Dr. Shika Jane, Assistant Professor of Medicine in the Division of Hematology, Oncology, and Cell Therapy at Rush University. Medical Center. She is the co-founder of the Women in Medicine Summit in Evolution and Empowerment. And joining Dr. Jane this year, this 
evening are our two co-chairs of the He for She track at this year's virtual summit. Lori Bagpe is a faculty member and director of healthcare leadership programs at Creighton University. She is a sought after speaker and author with broad experience building companies and leadership organizational change with specific expertise in healthcare management, EI and strength based leadership. Joining Dr. Jane and Lori is Dr. Thomas Varghese Jr. is the Executive Medical Director at Huntsman Cancer Institute, Head of the Section of General, General Thoracic Surgery, Program Director of the Cardiothoracic Surgery Fellowship, and an Associate Professor in the Department of Surgery at the University of Utah. We also have Lauren Green, who is live digital scribing our event today. You can find the video in the video gallery. At any point, you may pin her video by clicking the three dots by Lauren Green. You will receive a copy of the digital notes after the event. For those of you who joined us last year at the Women in Summit, you'll know that was a big highlight. I just wanted to take this time to thank each of you that have joined us this evening for your dedication and for your commitment. We have over 200 participants from six countries represented here this evening. Right now, I would like to cover some housekeeping notes. This conference is being recorded. We will be able to share a link with you after the event is complete. We welcome you to visit the content yourself, and we will also share it on the Women in Medicine um, website. We also invite your comments and questions. Please look at the Q&A box on your screen. If you think of a question at any point, just type it in there along with the speaker you would like that question directed to and we will pose it to the speakers during Q&A. You'll also find a chat box icon which you can ask questions in this box and if you want to chat amongst the audience, please use the chat box feature. Let's go ahead and do a poll. Since COVID-19, has your leadership child style changed? Yes, for the better, yes, but not for the better, or no? Please go ahead and vote right now. If you answered yes, please type in the chat box how your leadership style changed. Just give it a couple more seconds. So we have yes for the better for the win. So great. As we begin this evening, I'd like to pose to each of our esteemed presenters a question. Could you provide your top three must-haves that you do daily to maintain your sanity? And how does that differ from the old normal 40 days ago? Dr. Varghese, can we start with you, please? Um, I think that uh, it's not really a top three. It's probably just a top one. And, and it's just to remember that, uh, give people the benefit of the doubt. I mean, I think that that's the biggest key that I take with all this. It's an imperfect world. It's an imperfect science. But if we just give each other the benefit of the doubt, uh, everything will be for the better. Great. Thank you. Dr. Jane, would you like to add your comment? So my biggest thing I think I've realized is I need to give myself uh, more grace and cut myself a lot of slack because being a mom who's working from home, trying to incorporate virtual learning into my uh, actual job has been a challenge. And um, I have to stop comparing my, I've had to stop comparing myself with many others, which is a very big challenge when social media shows you all these amazing moms doing wonderful projects with their kids. And my daughter is, drawing on her own, but she is learning herself. So um, I think there's a lot to be said for giving ourselves grace during this time. Um, that's allowing me to lead both at home and professionally in a more uh, authentic way. <laughs> Great, thank you. And Lori, how about you? How would you like to answer this? You know, I would say the one thing that I um, have found to be incredibly valuable is just focusing on a, on a practice of gratitude. It's really easy to get distracted by all of the new to do's and demands and stresses and anxieties. But on the other hand, it really, really resets my mind every single time if I take a quick second to focus on what I'm grateful for. 
Um, and it's a great way to put my perspective, put everything back into perspective um, and, and practice mindfulness as you'll hear me talking about in a couple minutes. That's wonderful. And for the audience, if you'd like to share in the chat box any way that your top ways have changed from today through when we started this whole pandemic 40 days ago. So I'm gonna start another poll right now. Have you received training in how to lead during a crisis? Yes or no, please. Overwhelmingly, I find this not acceptable. Um, with that being said, I think it's if you're, when you're out of your comfort zone is dismantled, you're forced to face who you really are. And you need to have those skills to help. So here to discuss leaving through adversity is Dr. Shik Jane. Thank you so much, Polly. So uh, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today and taking time out of your very busy schedule. Um, we are in a unprecedented time. I would say if you had told me six months ago that we would be having this conversation around this topic, we would, uh, I would tell you that there's just, there's just no way. Um, real quick. Hey, Polly, I can't get the poll to close off of my screen. How do I close that? It should be a button that just says close. Let's see, aha, there we go, great. So I think the challenge that many people are facing right now when they're learning how to lead through a crisis is they're not really sure how they should be portraying themselves. A lot of people have asked me questions as to what do I do to make myself lead in a way that is authentic? And that brings about my topic today, which is leading authentically or being an authentic leader. So the concept of authentic leadership uh, was first introduced back in um, 2003, 2004, when a book was published, talking about the benefits of authentic leadership. And since then, a lot has been written on the topic, but it's really boiled down to four key components that really create uh, the, the persona of an authentic leader. So the first thing when you're talking about authentic leadership, the leaders who we identify as those who are most authentic and lead authentically are those who identify their own strengths and limitations. And they really are able to acknowledge the fact that they make mistakes and that they learn from them. The best leaders that I've ever worked with are those who are able to identify their strengths and their weaknesses, and they find others to lead with them or to help them or support them who fill in the gaps. So they identify where they are missing information or where they aren't as strong, and they find people to help them. And those type of, uh, types of leaders who realize they cannot be everything for everyone and who rely on their support staff, on their teams, on their colleagues to really create a well-rounded plan um, are the ones who are extremely self-aware and really genuine. Um, when you show your real self, when you show that you are human and you acknowledge the fact that you aren't perfect, I think that that shows a very humbling and strong quality in somebody who's leading authentically. The second thing is leaders who lead through crises and through challenging situations who tend to succeed are the ones who are the most mission driven and they're focused more on results as opposed to what is going to be their own benefit. For example, if you're working in an organization right now in the COVID crisis, the best thing to do is to think about solutions that are going to improve patient care or improve the outcomes for your institution or your hospital. The most authentic leaders are the ones who think about those types of challenges and improving the, grand, the greater scheme of the organization as opposed to looking for personal gain or personal self-interest. Oftentimes, by leading in that way, you do end up having benefits that come out of it. You will get um, recognition and potentially, you know, 
promotions in the future. Um, but feeding your own ego can be very dangerous and can be the downfall of many leaders. So really focusing on a mission and showing that you are interested in furthering the purpose of your organization, your institution, or whatever the bigger picture is, is how you can lead authentically. Leading with the heart is something that's also very important. So leaders who are able to show emotion and not just be compassionate, but also be empathic and able to be vulnerable um, are the ones who tend to be the most successful. Now, as women, oftentimes we have a challenge where it's a very fine balance where we don't want to be too emotional or be seen as too soft is what people say. But what, they, what the studies have actually found is that those leaders who lead with compassion and empathy and show their vulnerabilities actually have a better relationship with their employees and actually have a better results that come out of it. And it's not to be understated that while you're showing your emotion and empathy, you must also continue to have direct communication. And the ability to directly communicate while also being empathic is a skill that can be honed, but it is essential when it comes to authentic leadership. And then finally, focusing on long-term versus the short-term. So in a crisis such as we are currently dealing with, with the pandemic, there's a lot of short-term problems that need to be addressed immediately. And many institutions across the country are doing a fantastic job of doing that. However, you can't lose the forest for the trees. You need to look at these short-term solutions in the greater scheme of the big picture. So you need to make sure that you're looking at the, uh, the long-term plan and manage these short-term problems while looking at the big picture. Next slide, please. There was a study that came out of Poland looking at those who led authentically, and they found that people who had authentic leadership styles in business, oh, go back one slide, please, thank you. Um, people who actually led authentically in business and in, in the entrepreneur world, their employees actually had more personal initiative engaged more with their work and actually had more innovative behaviors. So by in implementing this authentic leadership style, you actually will not only get more from your employees, you will also get the opportunity to get more innovative ideas and see, um, and see the opportunities that may not otherwise be, be obvious to you by allowing your, your employees and allowing the people who you work with to really uh, create and uh, come up with creative solutions. The reason that this is such a big topic right now is as we have seen, there are physicians, nurses, healthcare workers around the country who are really using their platforms and their expertise to speak both on um, national media, to write op-eds, to get the information out there and to lead authentically. I chose these four individuals, Dr. Swami, Dr. Chu, Dr. Rainey, and Dr. Cass, because I think all four of them have done a phenomenal job of leading authentically. They've been able to weave in personal stories and anecdotes while also sharing facts. The other reason I chose these four is because they are all either intensive care unit physicians or emergency room physicians. And so they're able to use their expertise and use their experiences to guide the narrative that's currently ongoing in this country. And they're able to do it in a way that makes them relatable to people. And that I think is essential when it comes to being able to communicate with people who aren't necessarily in healthcare and showing the face of leading through an, a national crisis. Next slide. That being said, all of the physicians and healthcare workers that we're seeing lead are not necessarily in the emergency room or infectious disease or on the front lines. And so to really lead authentically, I think it's essential that you capitalize on your expertise. This group that um, I started with several other colleagues uh, earlier in the pandemic was meant to disseminate information and evidence-based information on the pandemic and all of the topics that are surround COVID, as well as advocacy and action plans and communicating with our local government. Now, none of the physicians on this team are, endocrine, are, are uh, infectious disease doctors or emergency room physicians. We're not virologists. We're not specialized in, um, in, in, uh, in COVID-19, but we are internists. We're endocrinologists. We're oncologists. And so we use our expertise that we have in our specific fields in order to uh, drive the narrative and be leaders for 
the public who are not in the healthcare system and to educate and to lead authentically by sharing our own personal experiences intermixed with facts. Next slide. And so finally, for people who uh, want to lead authentically and who want to be authentic leaders, whether it's in their own institutions or in, uh, in a national setting, there's seven strategies that have been shown to really showcase authentic leadership. I talked about identifying your unique strengths and talents. Compiling a list of your core values is essential. It's really important for you to be able to understand where, where your moral compass lies and how you can utilize that to really drive the mission that you have and to drive your leadership style. Ask your colleagues or your uh, friends or your boss for their perspectives on where your strengths and weaknesses lie. Getting those outside perspectives can be very useful in improving your leadership style and finding the holes that exist. Oh. Can you go back, please? Finding your authentic voice. So it's really essential that you make sure that when you are speaking, you stay true to yourself. Don't misrepresent yourself. Make sure that when you're speaking, you're speaking with facts and using your degree, whatever types of uh, information, evidence, facts that you have, but never misrepresent yourself. You need to be authentic. Interweave your powerful stories that you can. Developing a strong action plan is important, whether you're leading through a crisis or leading on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's constantly important for you to be reevaluating and realigning your priorities. Um, every night with our impact group, we go through and we reassess what is happening now, what do we need to focus on next, how do we, how do we pivot and shift depending on what's happening in the national conversation. And that's incredibly important as you lead through this COVID crisis and other challenges that happen in the future. You need to be flexible, malleable, and you need to adapt your leadership plan to whatever the, the crisis may throw at you. And so um, with that, I would like to uh, pass the microphone over to uh, Dr. Tom Burgess, who will be talking a little bit more about leading through a crisis. Hopefully everybody can hear me. Thank you. Thank you, Shika. And uh, I appreciate the opportunity uh, to share this. So uh, with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic as a background, uh, we're going to be really talking about how leaders make decisions during a crisis. And as Polly said in the poll in the beginning, it looks like the majority of our attendees haven't had any formal training uh, in this topic. Um, um, the outline for the talk today, we're going to be really talking about a few principles and then we're gonna go through in detail a case study using my own institution, the Huntsman Cancer Institute, and our response to the COVID-19, just to really show you what we did. Um, as uh, Shika uh, already said, that you know leadership, uh, there's a lot of definitions out there. There's tons of books, uh, webinars, uh, and it's really about you know leading a group. Another way to put it is uh, of the process of influencing another to accomplish a goal. And, and personally, I would say not just influence, but how do you generate a positive influence as well? One of my other favorite definitions of leadership is by the brilliant author, John Maxwell, who says a leader is one who knows the way, goes the way and shows the way. That is, it's not just somebody who pontificates or just has an honorific title, that they're actually modeling the behavior that they would like to do uh, in each and every single step of the way. Uh, in terms of a crisis, if you look at the Oxford English Dictionary uh, definition, um, it's both the situation, a time of great danger, difficulty, or confusion, uh, but it really is where important decisions must be made. And so it's really that twofold component. It's the opportunity for leadership, but really emphasizing that decisions need to be made in order to mitigate the crisis, overcome the crisis uh, as well. And obviously every single one of us knows the current crisis that's going on around the world. The WHO declared the COVID-19 as a pandemic on March 11th, and as of April 20th, there have been 2.5 million confirmed cases worldwide with 170,000 deaths uh, from the, directly from the disease. That's that we know of. Uh, and we all acknowledge that, those, that no, those numbers tragically are gonna keep going up uh, and that the impact will continue to be felt uh, long, uh, long into the future. Uh, and so when we're talking about principles, I really want people to focus on, there are two core tenants and three behaviors. So five total, 
And so those five are as follows. Um, the well-informed leader needs to make well-informed decisions during a crisis. Um, teaming is a verb. And those two things, the tenants are the ones we're going to be spending most of our time on. And there's three behaviors that the leader never forgets the lives uh, she or he impacts. The I'll go first. That is, is that whatever behavior, intervention, step that needs to be done, the leader needs to be willing to make the first uh, steps in doing that. And then human beings are human beings. And uh, as a result of that, you're going to see, anticipate and expect a lot of reactions uh, during the pandemic and long afterwards uh, as well. This is the beautiful campus that uh, I have the fortune of working at. Uh, this is the University of Utah Health Campus. And uh, specifically, I work at the Huntsman Cancer Institute. And the Huntsman and Cancer Institute uh, has as part of it a hospital, which is 100 beds, which are 84 acute care beds and 16 ICUs, eight operating rooms and six endoscopy suites. Um, and we're what we call a matrix organization because we're just one component of the health system as well. And it's critically important that we're interconnected not only regionally, but nationwide. We're a uh, NCCN uh, center, a comprehensive center. Uh, we're one of 30 uh, across the country. We're an NCI comprehensive ca cancer care center. And what that means is not only are we providing clinical care, but we have cutting edge clinical trials and those the findings of those translational clinical trials impact care. And we're an American College of Surgeons Commission on Cancer Accredited Program. And this becomes important because as we talk about assembling your team and connecting with content expertise, the luxury we have, are we're not only able to connect with the content expertise uh, locally, but also nationally and internationally as well and part of our response. And so the first principle we're going to be really talking about is the well-informed leader makes well-informed decisions. And it's really three things. Do you have the right team members around that can help you make those well-informed decisions? Are you uh, looking at and analyzing and acting on the right metrics? And what are the right communication strategies? And we're just going to briefly dive and talk about these three things uh, as well. So this is what our normal life looks like uh, before the pandemic. Um, I'm, I have the fortune of being part of the clinical leadership. We all report to our amazing CEO, Dr. Mary Beckerly. I serve as both the executive medical director as well as the chief value officer. Chief value officer in other organizations are the chief quality officer. So I work with my local teams. And what we, pre-pandemic, this team met once a week. And then once a month, I also had sit-down meetings with our University of Utah Health System, a chief medical officer, as well as the chief medical quality officer. And then I had other value council meetings as well, once a week as well. So that was pre-pandemic. And then obviously the crisis hit. And when the crisis hit, the first thing you have to think about is your organization. As I said, the, this is where matrix organization, this photo shows some of our clinical sites locally here on campus. But then when you start counting in all the other clinical cares, uh, the regional networks, you realize that the University of Utah has 117 clinical locations of care. And if you're, if you're interested, you can look on that website for all the details. And you have to account for this when you're responding in a crisis, because every single one of those points of clinical care are opportunities and, and, and points of care that you have to manage during the, during the crisis situation. This is what the command center turned into after uh, the COVID crisis uh, occurred. And you'll see that there's a lot more people that have been added on to this command center. You'll see that there's now representatives from infection control. There's representatives from the supply chain, from pharmacy, uh, there's public relations. Uh, and what ended up happening was instead of once a week, at the beginning of the crisis, this team was meeting twice daily. And then I was also meeting with the system leaderships every single day until we got a better control of the crisis. And then we started spacing out our meetings a little bit more. We still meet three times a week, but you can see that we have to not only get the right team members around, but you have to increase the frequency in terms of really critically making sure, do you have a handle of the situation and what metrics do you have to act upon uh, as well? So the first step is making sure you have the right team members around the table, making sure you have all those content experts in terms of the supply chain, content experts in infection control, content experts in epidemiology, content experts who can help navigate this crisis for the clinical enterprise as well. We then, as, long, as well as our largest health system in the region, Intermountain, came up with this color-coded framework, which we called the PACE response. And really the PACE response is 
green, the P primary, it's conventional. That's normal operations where there's no infection going on. The red is emergency. That's what we, our first step was. We shut down operations initially in our response to take accounting of what our supplies were, how many patients were infected, what do we need to do? And then you can see that the yellow and the orange, uh, the alternate and as well as the contingency as well. And you can see that this gradation color scheme is something that uh, almost all centers across the country uh, in one way, shape or form are doing. It's just really acknowledging the fact that you're constantly looking at what supplies are going on, what infection burden there is, and how can you respond as well to, to, to the uh, pandemic uh, locally as well as nationally. Another way to think about it is what are the five S's that you need in order to respond? And that includes space, staff, stuff, security, and special. And you can see all these different things. In terms of space, the reason why a lot of uh, some centers across the country are struggling with the response is because it's the ICU beds, which are the key limiting resource in your hospital. If your ICU beds are overwhelmed, if your ventilators are overwhelmed, it kind of paralyzes your system and you're not able to help out as other people, as more and more sick people come into the system. Uh, staff is there, you know, team members, the stuff, the, again, the supply chain, security. Now I'm not talking about security and being, you know, policing tactics. Security really also includes do patients feel safe? Do your healthcare workers feel safe in order to do the work that is needed? And then again, special includes uh, other things such as ICU beds uh, as well. And then once you take accounting of those five S's, then you can start creating these different org charts. This was kind of a template that we use at every one of our clinical locations across the system. And there will be little tweaks uh, uh, depending on the site, but it, it was really take accounting of the five S's, Think about the pace uh, response and then putting together whatever your org chart is, your working relationship at each of those clinical sites in terms of responding to this crisis. These are some of the metrics we look at. And one of the thing, key things you have to remember about metrics is every single metric represents a life. And so you have to remember those important things. These metrics are what we look at every single morning. That is who, uh, the number of utons that have tested positive. How many inpatients do we have? How many of those who are positive are in the ICU and so forth? And you start looking at all these, you have to have those broad ability to test to really get a capture of the burden of disease that you have locally at your site as well. And then one of the communication strategies we did is we realized with this matrix organization with so many people uh, that are involved, we needed a mechanism to broadcast or share with our entire team, our entire healthcare workforce of what we're doing. And so this is just a snapshot from an internal website where we did daily live web streams where leaders, different leaders went and talked about, this is the reason why we're doing a zero visitor policy, or this is the reason why we're enacting universal masking, or this is the reason why you have to do these different testing. Not only do you come up with a policy or procedure, but you really have to uh, acknowledge and figure out why you're doing those different things, uh, steps as you go forward. Uh, as well. You need to share the why, the reasoning before you enact anything in a crisis. And it's a good tip also in day-to-day -day life for regular leadership. At the Cancer Center, we really have to focus on three additional issues. And that is, one is, what is the impact of delaying treatment, the risk to life from delaying tr uh, cancer treatment versus the risk to life or a harm of infection if you proceed forward with the cancer treatment? The impact on social distancing and the impact on cancer delivery, as well as what resources that you have. We're fortunate to be one of the NCCN cancer centers. And one of the things that we ended up doing as part of this pacing is, is that I also serve on the best practices committee and I'm on the, uh, the board of directors for the NCCN. We, had week, we still have weekly conference calls with all the NCCN centers. And this gives us an opportunity not only to take accounting of what we're doing locally, but we can then share best practices and learn about best practices from across the country as well. And the NCCN actually on this website, if you're interested, you can find all the resources. You can see visitor policies, all the different things that we've done. We've shared that locally and we're getting ready to embark on, uh, you know, kind of a broadcasting or sharing the lessons learned during the, uh, the pandemic with other cancer centers across the country as well. You know, we, our patient population is an elderly patient population, lots of comorbidities, and of course, a lot of immunocompromised patients. So the risk of infection is sky high. We need to be very, very careful and deliberate about how do we care for these patients during the pandemic. 
Uh, this is a chi study from China uh, where they looked at 2007 patients from across 50, 575 hospitals. And these graphs are basically showing that if a patient has cancer and is undergoing treatment and they get an infection, their morbidity and mortality is sky high. And so this is the reason why we have to be very, very careful about if we're gonna proceed forward with the care and if they need it, we have to make sure that they don't get the infection at the time of the cancer treatment. Um, I was one of the founding uh, members and the initial president of this organization called the Thoracic Surgery Outcomes Research Network. It's an organization that has 26 institutions as part of the network. And we came up with this guidance for triage of operations for thoracic malignancies during uh, the COVID pandemic. It was just recently published online by both the Annals of Thoracic Surgery and the Journal of Cardiothoracic Vascular Surgery. And you can see that there are tables there. But the most important thing is every single table has, well, you, you take accounting of the number of COVID patients, your resources, and they have something called the compass statement. And what it is is really showing that depending on the resources you have, depending on the number of COVID patients you have, what is your ability to, do, to take care of cancer patients. So you can see in phase one, small number of COVID patients, lots of resources. You, you would only proceed with care uh, as long as you know, proceeding with care is not compromised by any sort of delay. And if you can delay by three months, that's great. But if you can't, go ahead and take care of that patient. In phase two, more COVID patients, less resources. Then at that point, it's urgent care. That you have to do that, otherwise there's a survivorship problem if you postpone it by a few days. And then the last one, your entire hospital system is only taking care of COVID patients, really the care is restricted to emergent care. And by doing these type of tables, we did this for thoracic surgery, a lot of other uh, specialties also followed suit. Uh, this gives us an opportunity to really brainstorm, and make sure we're following best practices around the world during the pandemic. Traditional oncology care is, really social and this has been really significant impact you know at the time of my clinic visit you know a typical visit before the pandemic was a one-hour visit with lots of family members seeing if you're eligible for a clinical trial we can't do that right now uh, now with zero visitor policies you know you've got the patient in front of you and then all of a sudden you're doing a conference call with telehealth lots of people calling in this has really impacted the way that we've taken care of patients, something we have to keep in mind as we go forward as well. And what is the new normal right now at our center and across the country? Temperature screening of all individuals coming into the center, zero visitor, really extremely restricted visitor policies in most places across the country, and everybody wears a mask at all times. I'm not wearing a mask right now because I'm isolated in my office. If I walk outside my office, I've got a mask and I've got plenty of masks sitting on my desk over here as we speak as well. This is an example of the visitor policy that was officially, and it's, it's published online uh, at the, on the NCCN website if you're interested as well. And we have to realize that traditional onco oncologic care consumes a lot of resources. We have to protect and preserve these resources during the pan pandemic and it's something we have to keep an eye on as well. This is the reason why we're doing all of this and why all these hospital systems are responding to this. It's this a concept that everybody's heard over and over again about flattening the curve. If you don't do protective measures, the number of COVID infected patients is gonna overwhelm your system and pay, people are gonna die. And what you're trying to do is do these type of things and roll things out, you flatten it so that even if the infections come in, you have the ability to take care of patients uh, as well. This is what we've done here locally in our system. You can see that if we had done nothing, that, that, that would have been the spike. You can see where the pace activation was and we've successfully flattened the curve right now. And because of that, here at Utah, we're fortunate enough that we're starting to ramp up operations back up again. Um, we know that we have the privilege of not being one of the hardest hit regions in the country, but this is the reason why we're paying attention to the metrics and trying to make decisions in real time. And we realize that, I don't know what the definition of normal is anymore, but this may be our reality for at least the next four to six months at the minimum, or it may be even longer and something that we have to really acutely take care of and keep an eye on as well. And so this is the reality for a lot of places around the country. You're planning and preparing for a large surge. And then once you think that things are comfortable and you have enough resources, you're now you're trying to restore care in the setting of an active COVID infection still going on. You have to keep, keep this in mind as you go forward. And so it's always this balance, the risk to life, bed availability, personal protective equipment. Do you have enough medications? Safety for all, safety of your healthcare workers, your team members, the patients, every single human being walking in the building as well. And so again, back to the principles, the well-informed leader makes well-informed decisions. And then the final thing I wanna talk about is this concept of teaming, which is really brought up by this brilliant professor, Dr. Amy Edmondson at Harvard, uh, where she talked about 
The definition of teaming is it's a dynamic activity, not a bounded static entity. It's largely determined by the mindset of practices of teamwork, not by structure. And really what she's talking about is teaming is teamwork on the fly. I highly recommend this book, something that'll help you in terms of your crisis uh, response. And it actually will help you with your uh, leadership uh, development in your day-to-day -day activities as well. And so as both Dr. Jane and uh, Lori Betke have said, we want you to continue to cut dialogue after, on Twitter long after this uh, webinar is finished. Please use the hashtag uh, WIM Stronger Together, and we look forward to uh, the, the conversation uh, going forward as well. Thank you all. And I'll turn things over to Lori. Uh, before we do that, Dr. Oh, Burke, we had one question that came in for you, well, a couple, but what characteristics did you use to define the right team members? Great question. It's a, really a combination of uh, three things. It's content expertise, um, I, the uh, experience, and uh, I think it's the principles of authentic leadership that uh, uh, Dr. Jane really outlined right in the beginning. Um, leadership is not just a title, it's what you do. That's why I love that definition that John Maxwell talks about. It's making the decisions, pattern recognition, realizing that you're never gonna have complete information, that you may need to make decisions with incomplete information but it's really being that authentic leadership. And, it, and the organization did a phenomenal job looking at that. And many of us have had the privilege of really going above and beyond what we've traditionally do. I don't know how to describe all the things I'm doing day to day right now. You know, it's not really captured in a CV, but one of the positives of this is that I've now got intimate knowledge of every single component of our healthcare system from what it takes for our environmental service folks to do their job all the way up. Um, and it's really given get, getting that in-depth look, but it is something that uh, you really are looking for authentic leaders. Those are the people that are needed in times of crisis. Thank you for that. Um, I'm going to launch a poll before we hand it off to Lori. So um, as we said, she's going to be helping us transition through the age of the pandemic and realizing how to get back to center. So I think it's really important right now. We know where exactly where everybody's at. Lori, does that surprise you? No, not at all. Um, I'm actually a little bit surprised that it's not that seems more balanced than I would have expected it. Um, so I'm a bit heartened, but um, you know, I, I'm so excited to be able to be a part of this session today because while we are right in the center of this pandemic crisis right now, when it comes to adversity, I really believe that it's a matter of, of if and not when adversity is going to strike us. And so what I want to encourage you around today is some content to think about the role of well-being in helping you to sustain an adversity. And so right now, while one of the very, very unique elements about this particular chapter in, in our global life is that it is in fact a global incident and it's not just geographically isolated or happening to one type of individual or one industry, this is so broadly experienced. But for any of us, when we think about what the role of well-being is in our preparedness to be effective leaders, adversity can present itself in myriad different ways. For some, over the course of our lives, it might be the loss of a loved one or a really devastating business or clinical outcome. It might be divorce or some financial hardship or some other major life stressor. And so the fact of the matter is, not any differently than the fact that when we think about our own financial well-being, we have money as a reserve to sustain us through upcoming expenses. If you're going to run a marathon, I would hope that you have prepared yourself with a good meal or some proper hydration and sleep so that you can sustain that effort. I want to challenge each of you to think about the way that um, well-being and attending to it in all of its different facets uh, can be impactful in your ability to be effective, to perform personally and professionally, um, and then to sustain adversity. Next slide, please. So our resilience is really heavily dependent on our well-being. And um, Gallup and many other companies have, have researched 
uh, well-being, but Gallup defines well-being as these five categories, purpose, social well-being, financial well-being, community well-being, and physical well-being. And it's interesting when you look at some of the recent annual reports uh, that come from Gallup and Healthways study of the US uh, workforce and well-being, only 7% of adults in the United States are thriving in all five areas. Um, but when individuals are thriving in all areas of their well-being, they experience some significant outcomes. They miss 70% fewer work days. Uh, they're 45% more adaptable to change when it presents. And uh, they're 59% less likely to look for a different job. And so I want to talk you through a couple of elements um, of well-being and mindfulness that I would encourage you uh, to practice. Next slide, please. The first is really to consider your emotional intelligence, bolster your emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence as a model, there are four domains, self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, and relationship management. And when we think about the importance of these behavioral competencies in our ability to respond rationally, calmly, without emotion or panic, when we are in the middle of a stressing circumstance or a crisis, it's incredibly important. Not only is it because if you're in an advanced position of leadership, others may be taking their cue from you. And whether it's just your individual decision-making or if your decision-making has much broader impact, the importance of really taking stock of and assessing our emotional intelligence is very important. And emotional intelligence is a lot like our physical well-being. We can bolster it. We can practice and invest in increasing our emotional intelligence, but if we are not paying attention to it, it will, just like our muscles, atrophy. Um, second, I want to encourage you to consider growth opportunities. For some in healthcare, um, there's actually a really substantial downtime. I have a lot of colleagues and friends in a private practice environment who have found themselves with no shortage of stress or pressure, but with a lot more time on their hands than they would like. And many have told me that they're choosing to invest in growth opportunities, whether it's listening to podcasts or choosing to undertake a little bit of a professional development exercise, or even thinking about your growth in its, in its myriad ways that it could present. The third is to really think about not neglecting self-care. And that can seem a little bit counterintuitive when you're in crisis because time can be at a premium um, and just the chaos that consumes our focus and attention can make it really, really challenging to find the way to invest in self-care, but none of us can pour from an empty vessel. And so think about ways that you can invest in your well-being. Take time to take a quick time out for a couple of deep breaths, if that's all you can take, or take a moment to get outside, get some fresh air, take a moment to take a day off if that's something that you need but make sure that you're investing in taking care of yourself. You are an incredibly important asset as it pertains to your ability to survive. Practicing mindfulness, like I just said, making sure that you're not letting circumstances dictate your mindfulness or your decision-making, even as simple as taking a moment to take a big breath or an inhale, using an app on your phone to find a meditation or a quick uh, some, some way to bring yourself back to the present and bring it back to maybe even thinking about something like I mentioned earlier, the practice of gratitude. It is an amazing way to practice mindfulness and put our mindset back into a position where we can be really effective as we're going forward in our personal or professional lives. Anyone who's heard me teach before knows that I'm incredibly fond of saying that we need to curate our circle. And that community well-being, that social well-being is an incredibly important element of how we sustain and experience crisis. So if you're an introvert like me, um, it can be really, really tempting to withdraw, to isolate, to, um, to just go dormant. And especially when pressure or stress is high, that can be the very most risky time for you to withdraw from a community, from a social support network. And so I want to intentionally encourage you to think about the ways that you can curate your circle. Let others have line of sight to you 
commit to being vulnerable and acknowledging when you're having a really tough day, when something's really, really causing you to feel like you're under duress, or maybe like you're not making decisions effectively, or when you need help, and being a contributing member of a community so that you can be that source of encouragement or you can be that source of support for others. Maybe it's the individuals that report to you in a professional context, or maybe it's people that you have line of sight to or colleagues to you. And the final piece that I would encourage you is to really think about embracing adversity. It's very, very challenging when we're in the crucible of a moment like this, but there's a favorite quote of mine from Billy Graham that says, Mountaintops are great for views, but fruit uh, is grown in the valley. And the fact of the matter is, if any of us look back over our life experiences and think about the times when we have grown the most, when the most formation occurs, it comes from times of duress, times of pressure, times of short resources. And while we are living that in what feels like an absolute extreme, and I think history will prove this to be one of the most monumental moments in our global history that will be formative to us, we can also take lessons from. So seek ways to learn from others, um, invest in growth, and think about the ways that you can reflect in the future on what we're living now so that it informs um, you and provides wisdom that will inform your future leadership. Thank you, Lori. Um, we had a question that came in that said, how can I reduce guilty feelings? Ah, oh, that's an amazing question. And I've actually had conversation with a couple of colleagues about that. And I'm not sure it's the specific context in which you are stating that, but I've got a couple. Uh, if you are feeling um, survivor's guilt, maybe you're not someone who is as immediately impacted by this as someone else. Maybe you're in line of sight to others who have been furloughed or downsized or on the front lines and in harm's way. You might be feeling survivor's guilt. If you were referring to that tendency that's natural for us, if I'm encouraging you to invest in self-care or you know, invest in sleep or exercise so you can come back to everything that's being demanded of you in a whole way, it can feel really hard to invest in that way. And we can feel guilty in taking time to go and hop on the Peloton for a class or stepping for a quick time out to do a five minute meditation on our app if that's what we feel like we need to reset. So I would just encourage you as, as was said earlier, give yourself a little bit of grace because everyone's journey through this is incredibly unique. And we had one more question for Dr. Varghese. It says, nice to see that despite lack of training, the framework I proposed for our response to COVID has similar, I'm sorry, that just disappeared. Oh yeah, I, 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 probably because Polly, I was typing the answer as you spoke. So <laughs> it's like, uh, it's, uh, so the question basically was, um, you know, as part of the communication strategies, we focus in our talk about with your team members and uh, the members of the organization. The question really was, is how do you engage the public in this? And, and it's a balance. And the balance really is looking at evidence-based principles, explaining the why. But the other part of the balance is you have to prevent widespread panic. And, and that's the reason why a part of your team members you have to engage in content experts like pu public relations experts and public relations officers and those people who are experienced in those type of things. You have to tell or explain to people articulately, just like Dr. Fossey is doing nationwide in the White House briefings, you have to explain to individuals the rationale why, but at the same time, you have to prevent panic because one of the things that Lori correctly alluded to Every one of us has some amount of fear. You know, we're worried about our health. We're worried about our family's health. All of us have that. Now you can imagine somebody who's not in the medical field, uh, you know, undergoing or trying to uh, acknowledge that. And so part of that is also getting in uh, experts in public relations. So, but uh, sorry about that, Paul. Yeah, I, I typed the answer. That's the reason why it disappeared. But that, that, that was where the question was, is how do you engage the public at, at large? Thank you so much for that. Um, I've heard it said that some feel that through the crisis, we will actually be able to close the gender gap because of 
more males staying home doing that. Can you each address that for the audience? Um, or Tom, go ahead. Yeah, I wish. <laughs> it's like, um, there was a phenomenal article that came out last week um, that uh, I believe it was the Washington Post, but it talked about the front lines, the face of the front lines of this pandemic are women. And the reason for that is, is uh, if you look at the different professions, uh, nursing, pharmacy, uh, uh, high numbers of w uh, women in those professions, um, uh, certain medical specialties are predominantly women. Unfortunately, other medical professionals are predominantly male. Um, my worry right now is, is that there is an economic impact to all of this. Are we going to start seeing um, wage cuts, layoffs, furloughs in really, really hard hit areas across the country? And if, if women are on the front lines, is that going to disproportionately affect them? Um, are certain organizations going to go back to what they're comfortable with, which sadly is a hierarchical organizational structure, and uh, which means that male dominated voices. Um, I pray and hope that doesn't happen. I, I hope that we can learn that we need to work better and we can eliminate the gender gap. Uh, but I'll be honest with you, my response to that question is, I have worry. Um, I don't know. Uh, and I think it's something we have to critically keep an eye on. Um, and hence the reason why an organization like the Women in Medicine Summit and other organizations are key during this response. We have to keep up the advocacy work. We have to keep up the work uh, in the face of this pandemic. We can't let our guard down is the honest answer. And I'll add to that. There's actually a lot of evidence that national crises like these actually set the gender gap, uh, set, uh, set the gender equity balance back decades. And a big part of that is there's been a lot of papers coming out showing that despite the fact that both men and women are now primarily working from home, the responsibilities for things like virtual learning with the children or childcare, it's, it's difficult to balance that. And so, especially in the academic world, there've been a lot of things coming out about how women aren't as productive. And so people will post on Twitter, if you don't, and if the pandemic doesn't end and you don't have three new skills and five new grants, then you failed. And people are responding saying, well, I have three children who are in three different grades and I'm trying to make sure that they get through their high school material. And so I think that the challenge is finding that balance. But unfortunately, as Tom said very astutely, we often fall back into these hierarchical methods. And so the hope is that things like the summit and other initiatives will continue to push the envelope. And hopefully we will come out with, with more equity, but I'm concerned that that will be the exact opposite of the case. And, and the only comment I would add to what Dr. Jane said is if, if you follow me on Twitter, or look at my, my pinned tweet right now is really something that resonated with me. We are not working from home. Let's be honest. In the midst of a global pandemic and crisis, we're trying to figure out how to manage by being in an uncomfortable situation, which we normally are not in. And I think that we have to give each other that grace. Um, I, yeah, if you can write grants and papers, God bless you. I, there are certain days that last night, I, I don't know. I, I was crazy yesterday. I did two OR cases, did seven conference calls. I collapsed last night. I was like, you know, forget this. <laughs> Just, I mean, you're going to have days like that. And, and I think that that's why, you know, what Lori said about, you know, uh, some of the strategies you need, you've got to give yourself also, you know, I, I said, started off, you know, Polly had asked about what's the one thing I'd say. I try to give other people the benefit of the doubt. You got to give yourself the benefit of the doubt sometimes as well. Um, and so, yeah, not, nothing we're doing right now is normal. It's not even close to normal. And I think we just have to remember that through, through this process. With that said, um, Lori, there's one more question that came in that I think is a great question directed towards you. It is difficult to cut down the hours and furlough employees as a leader. How do we integrate EI, emotional intelligence, into this rationale? Ah. Uh. That's an amazing question. And I think the thing that I would, would respond first is to make sure that you have a diverse decision-making uh, group. If there is any way possible as you're considering tough decisions like this, make sure that you're garnering input from others with multiple lines of sight that you may not have vantage to. So 
Uh, for colleagues of mine who are non-clinician administrators, I'm encouraging them to get diverse perspectives from multiple stakeholders that might know how to best prioritize and make those decisions so that they are in the best interests of everyone involved. And then second, as it pertains to our individual preparation to navigate that process of having tough conversations, I would say it's really important to have a high sense of, of empathy and humanity as you're approaching those. And so again, this kind of goes back to my, my call to action to everyone to curate their circle, find people who can be a nice objective sounding board if you're lacking some of the words or the perspective that will help you to wrestle with how you personally step into those decisions or those interactions that are necessary, then make sure that you can lean on your circle, find those colleagues who can give you good sound counsel as you're preparing to make those actions. Thank you so much for that. Um, I'm going to ask each of you the same question as we get ready to come to a close of our one hour program. You guys have been so insightful tonight. Um, I really appreciate you and taking the time out of your days to be with us. So if you could offer the audience one word and one positive ray of hope, could we, could you please share that as we depart tonight? Lori, I'll start with you. <laughs> Can I go last? <laughs> <laughs> or at least middle. <laughs> okay, Tom, then it's up to you. It's up to me. <laughs> no pressure. Um, I think anybody who says they know exactly what the path forward is, they're lying through their teeth. <laughs> and I think that one of the things I would say the uh, I am hoping what will happen is if everybody's imposter syndrome just goes away. I, we're all learning together. None of us are experts. And, and I think that you'll start to realize that the true authentic leaders will express that. They will tell you up front, with the information I know at this minute with the timestamp, this is my advice. And that advice may change hours from now. Uh, you guys may have seen that I stepped away from the video just briefly during this uh, webinar because I had to take, feel a phone call from my chief medical officer for the system because we're dealing with a, a crisis right now. We're just taking care of that. But a lot of that is, is that we're learning together. The journey ahead is unknown. So my positive is I'm hoping imposter syndrome goes away because all of us are imposters right now. We're all trying to learn together. And, and I'm hoping that that's a positive that will come out after the pandemic. Thank you for that. Lori, now it's up to you. Yeah, I will just say, you know, again, it is remarkable the tenacity and the strength and the collective wisdom of humanity. And when you're looking for examples of brilliance and beauty, it is easily spotted inside our own communities and organizations and definitely globally at this point in time. And we have a choice on what we give our attention and energy to, and there is good to be found. And so I would just encourage you to continue to seek that out. And for those of you who are being that light, thank you. Thank you. Dr. Jane? So I will end with this. Uh, we are, as I said at the beginning, we are in unprecedented times. And when we come out the other end of this, which we will, we will come out the other end of this, there will be a new normal. And there will be a lot of changes in place. Some of them are going to be really good and some of them are going to be challenging. And it's up to us to view things in a way where we can make the best of the situations and move forward with the best of our abilities and come out of this with a positive spin. We really need to use the challenges and the adversity and all of these, these things that we're learning through this crisis to better ourselves to better our systems and try to come out the other end with some positive things. So I think that the biggest challenge we all have is getting through this. And you know, as Tom said very smartly, we're not really working from home, we're surviving at this point. So I think, again, give yourself grace. Remember that nobody is perfect. Everyone is, is going through their own challenges and what you see on social media is really only a small snippet of people's lives. So that mom who did six projects with their kid today, remember she probably is struggling with something else as well. So just uh, give yourself grace. And um, I wanna thank everybody so much for joining us today um, on this webinar. We uh, will be 
putting out some more webinars as a, in, over the next couple of months, so please stay tuned for that. The Women in Medicine Summit is going to be completely virtual this year and registration will open tomorrow. So go to our website, www.womeninmedicinesummit.org. Um, we opened our abstracts and award nominations yesterday. So please look out for those. Also, those are on our website. And we would really love to continue this conversation with you through social media, through conversations. This is a conversation I think that needs to continue for a very long time. So feel free to find us on Twitter, on Instagram, on LinkedIn, wherever your social media um, predilections lie. Um, I'm at Shiga Jane MD. Tom is at Tom Varghese and Lori is at Lori Varghese or at uh, Lori Bedke. So please find us on social media and we look forward to uh, having you join us again for another webinar in the future and then seeing you all October 9th and 10th at the Women in Medicine Summit virtually. Thanks again, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you, everyone. We will send out the CME certificates after they are processed by the University of Illinois at Chicago. Have a safe evening and a great night. Bye.